In the year 986, a Viking ship penetrated Arctic ice, guarding the coast of an unknown land. The frigid waters teemed with life. A Viking colony was established at the very edge of the known world, in a country the settlers named Greenland. Three and a half centuries later, a ship from Europe put into the settlement. The sailors found the colony empty, abandoned, desolate. Why had the Viking settlers vanished? Eskimo legends describe a North American tribe of giants and dwarves. Is there a link between these Eskimo legends and the mysterious end of the Viking colony on Greenland? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations but not necessarily the only ones to the mysteries we will examine. A bronze warrior marks the saga's beginning. A thousand years ago, Eric the Red led a fleet of Viking ships from this Icelandic harbor west into the unknown sea. It is a story that ends in mystery. History's tides have swept past man's fainter tracks, leaving only scattered patterns that seem to lead nowhere. Time has almost obliterated the adventures of one particular man. Eric the Red was an old-style Viking, earthy, wild, fiercely independent. Ten centuries ago, in Norway, Eric killed some king's men in a bloody fight. He fled to Iceland. He found the land already settled. Then, as now, its people were sheep farmers and fishermen. They had recently become Christians, and with the zeal of converts, built churches over the holy sites of their pagan days. The cults of the Old Norse faith were savagely suppressed but Eric the Red continued to worship the Norse god, Thor. July 1978, a small crowd gathers at a solitary farm in a rural district of western Iceland. They have come to witness secret rites banned since the days of Eric the Red. Ben Bjorn Beintansson has revived the old pagan faith. His followers call him All Share Your Goli, High Priest. We have old gods in our religion. Uh, our Vikings, the old Vikings, they, if they was going to sail somewhere, they asked the spirit, the sea god, and uh, battle god, the uh, fight god, you know, okay. and then we celebrate and we drink for your healthy. This, this is a Thor's hammer. Thor's hammer symbolized the old Norse faith. It represented a thunderbolt, a mystic sign venerated in northern Europe since prehistoric times. Then Bjorn Beintansson leads his followers into a mountain sanctuary far from the roads and towns of modern Iceland. The Vikings worship the primal forces of nature. 
chief deity was the sky god, ruler of storms, wielder of thunderbolts. After 10 centuries of suppression, a horn of mead is once again offered to mighty Thor. On the plain near Thingvellir Falls, the past is celebrated. Modern Icelandic farmers assemble as their ancestors did in the summer of 982. Horses are judged today. A thousand summers ago, they judged men. Norse freemen gathered here to politic, to settle disputes. Times were changing. Life was becoming more orderly, civilized. That spring, Eric's axe had swung in another bloody brawl. Eric the Red was outlawed. Eric fled. He sailed west, west into the unknown. From northern mists loomed a massive island, ice-bound, uninhabitable, but for a narrow strip of land on its southwest coast. Here, Eric's people settled, optimistically calling their new home Greenland. They homesteaded, building houses and barns, enclosing pastures and fields. But even in Greenland, Eric the Red did not find complete refuge. Eric's wife raised Greenland's first church, she barred Eric from their home until he agreed to give up pagan ways. But evidence suggests the old Viking's conversion was not complete. Greenland's fjords could not sustain the colony. Crops would not grow. The land's wealth was to be reaped only in its wilderness. Small groups of Norse hunters fanned out through a vast expanse. Arctic seas soon wrecked their long ships, but they pressed on in small open boats on voyages that must have lasted years. Rarely were European ships able to journey to distant Greenland. Years elapsed between visits, but a few Arctic treasures lured traders to venture west. One of those treasures was the Jeer Falcon. Sultans and caliphs offered coffers of gold for a live Greenland falcon. Arab court geographers told them this fierce and most valuable hunting bird came from world's end, from the fabled Ultima Thule, the land farthest north. Norse hunters pushed beyond the edge of the known world. Narwhal, the great horned whale of the high Arctic. In distant Europe, Medieval alchemists sold the whale tusk as unicorn's horn, ground into magical potions. A single narwhal could make a hunter rich for life if he survived the vast, uncharted wilderness and succeeded in making his way back to Greenland. Few returned. Fewer ships arrived from Europe. The Norse Greenlanders sank into ever deeper isolation and were lost to history, except for a single brief reference. In 1300, church annals noted that a Greenlander had been burned at the stake for secretly practicing the old faith. After that, there is only silence. In the summer of 1342, a ship put into the western settlement. It carried a bishop sent from Europe to investigate why the Greenlanders had fallen behind in their church tithes. 
The Norse farms were empty, abandoned. There was nothing else, no messages, no signs of life. The settlers had simply vanished. For the last 600 years, the fate of the Norse Greenlanders has remained one of history's most baffling puzzles. In 1921, archaeologists dug near Cape Farewell at Greenland's southern tip. They found a church graveyard and the huddled remains of hunchbacks, dwarves, sterile cripples. Was the mystery solved? Had the Norse colony died out from inbreeding and malnutrition, from severest cultural isolation? At the cemetery's edge, pointing west toward America, was a coffin, nearly seven feet long and empty. The withered end of Eric's people, or only the poor and weak left behind. The search for the lost Vikings of Greenland leads us to the northern coasts of Canada. Here, even in summer, Arctic seas rage. Travelers peer anxiously into the distance, looking for the signs of safe harbor that mean Payne Bay. Payne Bay, swept by fierce tides, frigid, remote, yet teeming with life the richest caribou lands in Canada's eastern Arctic. Bear, trout, char, seal, and whale. High above Payne Bay, visible at sea for many miles, stand three beacons. It is believed they predate Columbus' first voyage to North America by centuries. A 500-pound rock crowns 15 feet of carefully laid stone courses. Yet the primitive Eskimo who roamed here when these sea beacons were built were four feet tall and lived in holes roofed with whale ribs and animal skins. Professor Thomas E. Lee of Quebec's Université Laval has spent 12 years seeking the builders of Payne Bay's curious ruins. Lee has developed a theory not accepted by some experts. The modern Canadian Eskimo community of Payne Bay has proved a rich source of information and has led Lee to develop his unique theory. Hello, Tom Slee. Modern technology has overwhelmed the ancient lifestyle of the Inuit community. Where once the young learned the ways of the Eskimo from their fathers, now state-run schools provide education and gradually the old ways are becoming dim memories. Vaguely remembered are the legends of dwarves and giants that roamed the land. The tunic. Legends that reach deeply into the Inuit past. This is my grandmother, Minianahatak, and her grandchild, Lalianahatak. Mrs. Mini Anahatak was born 79 years ago in the igloo of an Inuit winter hunting camp. <laughs> Professor Lee records tribal memories he believes date back nearly 800 years. Uh, his parents. Anahatak got this story from his parents. And they got this story from the Inuit who lived in Sakluk. That's why they got this story. And they could lift big stones. Thank yes, God. they've heard that they were uh, fairly strong. What kind of people were they? There were two kinds. Big and small one. Even though they were small one, they were still strong. So there was almost the giant tunics and also the small tunics. Now why they were scared of uh, Hadlunaks? Because it was the first time they met Hadlunaks with white skin and bushy. They were different than Inuit. They had beards. Yeah, Or maybe they had bushy eyebrows, <laughs> etc. <laughs> I first saw Pamiak Island in 1966. I had two Eskimo or Inuit with me, 
one of whom was an old man by the name of Zachary Azy. Professor Lee has made a series of spectacular discoveries in this seldom visited region of Arctic Canada. He believes that he has identified the legendary tunic. Near the Payne River's mouth lies Pamiok Island. When I first saw it, it was in a wild and beautiful setting, in sort of an amphitheater. It was extremely impressive because of its great size and setting. Well, Zachary Azy took me across the island and, and then left me and pointed in, in the direction in which I should go. And he said it was built. Well, he would express it by saying before, 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 before. The central buildings in ancient communities were the longhouses, communal sleeping quarters. The Pamiok Island longhouses provide Dr. Lee with a basis for his theory. This enormous longhouse was 83 feet long and 20 feet wide inside dimensions. It was rather ship-shaped with the walls out curving a little bit and this is the, the north room, the uh, sleeping quarters. The stones in the walls were very heavy. This particular stone weighs over a thousand pounds. And here we enter the great hall with 11 fireplaces down the center. And since there were 11 food storage pits on the outside of the building, I think it is very obvious that there were 11 families. And if we suppose that there were five people in each family, then we have a, a approximately 50 or 55 people living in this longhouse. And that, of course, means social organization far beyond the scope of the Eskimo. People who lived in this house were, in my opinion, Norsemen. I think that they were hunters from Greenland, came here just the men alone, and probably they married native women and had half-breed children. This was a very rich hunting place. It still is. Professor Lee believes that a handful of Viking hunters cut themselves adrift from the dying Greenland colony and settled here in North America eventually fathering a tribe of mixed bloods. Lee's theories have been hotly attacked. His opponents claim the longhouse was built by Eskimo. Yet the nearest forests that could have supplied beams for its caribou skin roof lie 150 miles to the south. They could only have been brought by ships, which the Eskimo never had. The Eskimo were well adapted to this environment. Never would they have built such a drafty, cold structure. Lee believes it served as a primitive palace. That longhouse was a part of a complex which extends up the coast all the way to Diana Bay, about 70 miles farther north. You find these longhouses at intervals along that distance. And I have thought about this as being a sort of a kingdom. An Arctic kingdom whose leaders were Norse and whose followers were Stone Age Eskimo. The remains of their crude tent rings still crowd around the longhouse. The Eskimo had much to learn from Iron Age Europeans. Excavating carefully, Professor Lee found the weathered blade of a Norse battle axe. If we put out from this small bay and sail on a course that is due east with a favorable wind, in one week's time we will come directly into Eriksfjord on the southwest coast of Greenland. Did a remnant of Eric's people at long last find refuge here in this Arctic fastness? Set on a ridge not 50 yards from the great longhouse, these stone tombs crown Professor Lee's sensational findings. In them, he discovered what he believes are the remains of a primitive Eskimo, a mixed blood, and that of a medieval white male, the first and only pre-Columbian European skull ever found in the Western Hemisphere. Lee's discoveries have stirred fierce controversy. Textbooks are not easily rewritten. 
Old theories tell us that past cultures lived and died in strict isolation. But new ideas suggest that mankind's evolutionary steps may have been closely linked. In death, the Norse Greenlanders gave birth to a new kind of Eskimo, bigger, stronger, more skillful, whose descendants still hold the land farthest north. A day's journey upstream from the Payne River's mouth, modern Inuit pitch a hunting camp. Yeah, I saw a lot of tracks. This is the only one we saw. Centuries pass, but Arctic life does not change. 22 Magnum. Hunters still travel the river in search of caribou. I think that we have just begun to get at the answers to the Norse presence in Ungava. We've just scratched the surface. We, we have not finished with the Payne Lake evidence by any means. We need at least one more expedition in there. And along the coast of Ungava, out this way, we have reports of longhouses that we have not been able to see. I think there may be a great deal of evidence remaining. In fact, I sus suspect that we will find more things in the interior someday when we do some thorough searching. On the heights above the camp stands a beacon that points deep into the North American some interior. Some people say that this was made by the Inuit or the Eskimo. But as you can plainly see, this is a Thor's hammer.